about just some definitions and kinetics when it comes to kids and how drugs move through their body uh, at different rates than adults uh, and some of the general trends we see with pediatric medicine. Um, terms generally premature, uh, less than 36 weeks gestation, and uh, usually once the birth happens up to one, one month old, you still see some of those premature issues coming up. And we'll talk about some of those. Um, term neonates, greater than 36 weeks, infant uh, up to a year, child up to 11 years, and adolescent uh, post-puberty. All right, so absorption. Um, the general assumption, assumptions, assumptions in children are decreased gastric motility, decreased acid secretion, decreased GI transit time, or sorry, increased GI transit time, increased percutaneous absorption. Uh, probably makes sense for, for most of this. Uh, think about, like, especially little kids and how they move things through the body, lots of frequent stools, especially at young ages. Uh, and then that normalizes as they get older, right? It becomes close to adult fairly quickly. Um, not to say, like, this stuff doesn't change. I think for percutaneous absorption, for creams and ointments, we really have to be cautious. So like for steroid pot potency, for example, um, with a kid, you're going to want to use a much less potent steroid over smaller amounts of the body just because it's going to absorb quite a bit more um, readily into the systemic circulation than uh, an adult patient would. Protein binding. Newborns have decreased protein binding and altered lower levels of albumin. Uh, most of the time, this doesn't matter for your general kid. Uh, for kids with specialized diseases, it might. So like a kid who might have um, epilepsy, a lot of our anti-epileptic drugs are highly albumin bound, and that would be something we'd want to consider. Potentially, you might see higher free levels in those patients just because um, of that reason. Now, dosing for pediatrics takes these things into consideration. So it's not just simply weight, and we'll talk about that too. So it's not like you have to really think too hard about it. The nice thing is, the majority of medicines out there that are recommended or used in peds patients have dosing recommendations behind them. So all you really need to do is know how to use a drug monograph, just like you would look up an adult dose, but just so you know some of the rationale behind it. Um, free water changes, I'm not super worried about you knowing that, but there is a chart I have on here just to show you the differences in um, percentage of total body weight and uh, with water versus extracellular water and body fat and how that changes as people get older. Kind of steadies out pretty, again, pretty early. Once they approach a year, it's not that much different than when they're an adult, but in those early kids, that's when you're going to see. So if you go into neonatal medicine, you're really going to see a lot of kinetic differences and changes. If you practice more general peds, not quite as much. Uh, metabolism. Hepatic enzyme activity. Generally, neonates are going to have slow uh, liver function, that's going to ramp up very quickly. Infants will have quite fast. And then um, up until adolescence, it's usually really rapid metabolism. Kids are going to metabolize things quite a bit faster than adults. Um, and then young adults will stay kind of high, and then it'll gradually taper down as people get to like the late 20s, early 30s. But um, it does peak fairly quickly there. I'll show you a chart on that here in a second. Um, SIP ox oxidation and phage, phase two conjugation. So this is both the different phases we look at when it comes to hepatic metabolism. Um, pretty predictable in adults, but varies really widely in children. So for example, um, if you look at morphine, for a neonate, the half-life is about 7.6 hours, one to three months, 6.2, six months to two years, 2.9, uh, and other children, one and a half hours. Adults varies from two to four hours. So that's the standard adult. You can see for kids, when they're really young, it's going to be a much slower metabolism. That's because of the hepatic enzymes that are clearing and, and making the um, availability of those morphine molecules to get metabolized into excretable products. Just isn't as active. Uh, another chart just to show the differences. And again, by one year old, you're pretty much have full activity, and it's going to be similar to what you'd seen in an adult. But you can see that some of the enzymes are much more active later and very, almost fall off. Like you really don't have, this would be a conjugation enzyme, so phase two reactions. You don't have much of that in the first parts of life, and then that really builds up. And then you do lose some other types of things. So 2D6 activity tends to drop off for some reason. I don't know. I wouldn't pay much attention to this. Again, I'm not going to test you on the differences of this. I would just like you to know the trend that it takes a while for that to ramp up, at least in that first year of life. Renal function is related to gestational age, so 22 and 34 weeks are landmark development. So if your kid is premature, that's where you're going to see the biggest issues. And that's pretty much the rule of thumb when it comes to any uh, early medicine in kids, is premature is going to affect things, especially renal function and pulmonary function, I think, are the two kind of areas where you're going to be careful with. 
Um, term infants will generally have high creatinine clearance, but we use different equations. So again, I'm not going to go into this because I don't want you to know it unless you really want to practice in peds. You're going to have to maybe use different equations. But just to know they use different equations in kids. So there's something called the Schwartz equation, uh, which more goes on uh, our specific age-related constant, looks at body length versus creatinine as a, as a biomarker. And urine output generally is much more accurate. So if you work in like um, like um, a med ped situation or you do like neonatal intensive care or anything like that, um, you're certainly going to use the kid's um, urine output as your primary marker. And that goes for adult medicine too. Urine's always, urine output is always the best marker of how functioning the kidneys are, but we don't always measure urine on every patient. So certainly um, equations can come into play. Um, Preterm to adolescence, volume of distribution goes down, uh, creatinine clearance goes up. And uh, here's a, another example just to show you. So we've got gentamicin here, um, half-life for this antibiotic. Neonates can range really variably, and that's, again, because you're looking at kids of all different gestational ages, possibly, in different studies out there. So more premature, going to be closer to that 12-hour half-life. Uh, more full-term, going to be closer to that 4-hour half-life. Um, child adolescent drops substantially, and it approaches pretty close to adults. Adults having a little bit higher end range there. So again, just to highlight the differences and trends there. <coughs> uh, this is just a chart to show the range of um, GFR. Uh, Peramino hyperuric acid, don't worry about that. That's a second biomarker that sometimes is used in different literature as opposed to creatinine, but um, GFR would be based on creatinine clearance. So they're just trending it here differently. But I, I picked this chart just to show you differences between the age groups and, and how much they're clearing uh, per minute there. All right, dosing issues generally. So this is probably the most important stuff to think about because, again, you don't really have to think about, I mean, if you're working in specialty medicine with, with kids who are really sick and have organ dysfunction, sure, some of this is going to come into play more so than others. But at the end of the day, we have dosing monographs. We have recommendations for renal failure in kids. We have recommendations for hepatic failure in kids. A lot of this has been studied uh, and is well documented in the different online monographs we have access to, fortunately. Uh, but generally speaking, our smaller size people require smaller doses. Um, kind of relative, though, if you look at Tylenol's dosing, for example, 10 to 15 mg per kilo. If you gave a 15 milligram per kilo dose to a 100 kilo adult, you'd be giving them 1,500 milligrams of Tylenol, which is more than you'd ever give somebody in one single dose. We max it at one gram. So relative, it's actually kind of a bigger dose you can give a kid if you look at their total body weight and what you're actually giving them. However, remember taking into consideration their higher metabolism and those types of things, it, it normalizes a little bit. So Something to pay attention, just a little pro tip. Most drugs are dosed in mg per kilo. That's pretty common. However, sometimes you'll see it, like if you're dosing an antibiotic in a kid, it might say mg per kilo per dose or mg per kilo per day. So just pay attention to that. And it'll say maybe mg per kilo per day, divide in three, two, three doses, whatever it is. Or it might say mg per kilo per dose, two to three times a day. So just pay attention to that. Um, I've been, well, I, I don't know. I've known if I've ever been burned on this personally. I've had colleagues that have been burned on this big time where um, somebody's inputted pounds instead of kilos, and then you end up double dosing or overdosing your patient significantly. Um, with antibiotics, it's not usually a big deal. The kid's not going to be harmed by that in most cases, but it's still something we don't want to do, right? So um, I always double check dosing whenever I do. I do a little bit of peds practice through our West Health ED because we see peds there, and um, I always double check when I'm changing antibiotics with parents just to make sure that we got the weight right on our computer. Uh, all right, pro tip, uh, again, double check the weight and then pay attention to those recommendations. Um, if no recommendations are available, it's really rare and you probably won't see this happen, but you can take a general rule of thumb and take the kid's weight divided by 50 kilos times the adult dose. And that's sort of a starting point to think about. There's a lot of other really complicated equations to estimate starting doses, but again, we aren't, you and I aren't ever going to have to deal with that. So I just put that general one in there for kind of a guideline for how somebody might approach that if they didn't have it, but I've never come across that, so I don't think you will either. Um, drug research issues, so just some general things about pediatric drug research. Studies in children are really lacking across the board. There's not a lot of evidence out there with kids. It's kind of like pregnant patients. We just don't have a substantial amount of data. Um, there are ethical considerations at play, of course. Um, FDA has incentivized drug companies over the years to do more studies in pediatric patients. So, for example, they'll offer an ex a patent extension if they'll do some sort of pediatric research as sort of a financial incentive. We'll give you a six months or a year more on your patent if you can prove that it's safe in kids. Um, especially for drugs that are being rampantly used in kids. So mental health is a great example of that. Use a lot of our antidepressants and antipsychotics in kids. Very few of them have data in really young patients. 
a few of them have data in like you know the the late childhood early adolescent phase uh, but not a lot of them have very robust data to be in so you'll see that come up as one of the FDA's options to get people to, to get companies to do more more testing in those populations um, growth and development effects uh, on drug uh, absorption distribution metabolism excretion can only be confirmed with studies so we really can't do that just by anecdotal evidence right we need some kind of a study whether it's small or large um, that's a good question but um, if we don't have options for pediatric actual human patients sometimes juvenile animal studies are done to, to determine some of this stuff and we extrapolate that not the best obviously but it's better than nothing um, off-label youth use and safety reporting a lot of our drugs uh, have been grandfathered in over time haven't ever been studied in peds extensively but they've been used for years and we just assume for the most part it's okay um, for example albuterol um, nebulization is not indicated technically in kids under four for the fda we use it in babies and little kids all the time so certainly not just an example of something you'll see come across that all the time if you work in peds just stuff that doesn't have that fda indication because no one's ever really studied it but it's been used in common practice for years Kind of like pregnancy and lactation it's the same thing we, we base it off of what evidence we have to go on and sometimes it's looking at things retrospectively or using anecdotal evidence when available adherence is usually left up to the parents so some kids can be resistant if you ever tried to give a child medicine you know I don't, one of my kids loves taking it the other one hates it so you know mixed bag i suppose um, some adolescents can administer in their own meds i think a lot of them can be trusted to do that depending on how responsible they are certainly um, having the parents understanding medication reminder systems like pill boxes checking for missed doses things like that is kids can get busy especially if they're in high school or whatever and, and just get caught up in missed doses and things like that convenience less frequent administration times are preferred for kids sometimes if you have the option between two drugs you know when when in, in adult medicine we usually try to do this too but sometimes in kids we might choose like an antibiotic that might have slightly broader spectrum coverage because it's a once daily thing versus um, like for example strep throat you can use penicillin or amoxicillin amoxicillin has some data for once daily dosing in kids and uh, that's a lot more convenient than giving penicillin twice a day for most people even though amoxicillin slightly broader spectrum yes penicillin would work just fine it is really only going to be a better choice if you want to be a really good steward we don't really care that much when it comes to kids so pushing that spectrum of activity up a little bit to get the convenience is generally acceptable in pediatric patients dosage forms that work for the patient uh, or good education overall on how to administer drugs <clears throat> um, Liquid forms certainly are going to be popular in peds patients, especially for the, the majority of younger children who can't swallow tablets or haven't ever had experience swallowing a tablet. Um, chewable tablets can work in some kids. Taste is really important. Some antibiotics especially taste terrible. So if a kid, like penicillin, uh, go back to penicillin. Penicillin also tastes kind of bad compared to amoxicillin. Amoxicillin generally has tastes better for whatever reason and so um, that's another reason why we prefer it but like the cephalospore and seftonir uh, is a really popular choice for kids because of its flavor profile um, not necessarily because it's the best third generation cephalosporin out there but it tastes good when it comes in the suspension so it's used popular its use is really popular I should say all right sorry about if the recording looks weird I'm gonna try and adjust this for some reason my PowerPoint's off I don't know why it's resized that you guys probably see this on your screen too hold on let me just resize my window here I don't know why it did that okay so the nice thing about peds is that there's very few medications that are absolutely contraindicated in kids most of the stuff we use in adults can be used in pediatric patients it's again just getting the dosing right and getting the intervals right there are a few exceptions a lot of them are with infectious diseases and with infectious disease it's going to be if you work in general medicine primary care you're going to see infectious disease in kids more often than not compared to other things so that's why I'm going to spend a decent chunk of time focusing on it all right sulfonamides sulfantibiotics and Bactrim use is contraindicated in infants less than two months old again very specialty subgroup people working with neonates but if you do get that little kid um, in your primary clinic or pediatric clinic and they are under two months and they have a UTI this would not be something we want to use the exception is it would be really rare and if they have HIV positive infants with uh, pneumocystis pneumonia which again super super rare 
Um, Kernicterus is the reason why this is a risk. So Kernicterus happens when you have unconjugated bilirubin leaking into systemic circulation and not getting cleared fast enough. It can cause brain damage, which can lead to encephalopathy and all kinds of CNS-related complications. Um, that's, that's really it all to know. After two months, uh, the body has enough albumin usually in circulation where you can give sulfonamides fairly safely. So and one little caveat there just for kids under two months. Um, tetracyclines, I think I talked about this one being kind of controversial, but the recommendation still remains that you should generally avoid this in the first eight years of life. Um, if your permanent teeth have all come in, it's thought to be okay. Only kids with baby teeth still would be excluded from use in the first eight years of life. Uh, or if they still have baby teeth later in life too, probably exclusion. Um, because notable permanent tooth discoloration, unknown mechanism, calcium chelation. Again, I, again, I thought, I think I talked about this in the fall a little bit. The evidence isn't solid for this. Um, and there are some things that doxycycline is preferred for. So Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, a couple other things that are a little bit more unusual, but stuff we do see a lot in Minnesota. And if your kid's hospitalized uh, because of one of those illnesses, they might want to use this anyway. Uh, so. It is, um, there are some studies out there that looked at kids who were treated with doxy uh, specifically. Um, tetracycline itself is rarely used at all as an antibiotic, so I'm not going to talk about that. So really we're focusing, and tigacycline is rarely used either. So really talking about doxy here is the primary drug that you might see wanting to be used in kids. And based on looking at, you know, groups of kids who've been treated for Lyme or Rocky Mountain, uh, I don't think they've seen a lot of cases, if any, of this actually happening in real life. So why this happened, we, we aren't really sure if maybe it was pregnant women who took it, and that's more of the risk, versus actual children taking it, not as high risk. So again, it's not an absolute contraindication, but generally speaking, we try and avoid it just because of that. Uh, salicylates, so examples of salicylates would be aspirin products or Pepto-Bismol, anything that contains like a menthol subsalicylate, stuff like that. Uh, there's different combination um, products on the market. <clears throat> Generally avoid it in all children and adolescents. The exception would be as low-dose antiplatelet in pediatric patients with indicated CV disease, so very um, unusual subset of population of kids. Uh, it can cause something called Ray's syndrome, which is an acute illness characterized by encephalopathy and fatty degeneration of the liver. Yes? Is there a children's version of Pepto? Because I feel like I think there are some. Like, like, one, like, one, that, like one that doesn't <laughs> one that doesn't contain a salicylate? Yeah, I Possibly. I mean, Pepto is a brand name, so they could have uh, like a pediatric-friendly formulation that doesn't have a salicylate in it. But um, standard Pepto-Bismol has a salicylate product. And then concerned to still raise syndrome. Yeah, so, yeah, right. So Ray's super, super rare. It's thought to be um, have some viral illness as well with it, but uh, it's because of its correlation with salicylate products, we don't recommend using it. So, yeah. The odds of, I don't know what the incidence would be. It'd be really small, even if you gave all your kids aspirin. And so people get confused. It's like, oh, it's baby aspirin. I can give it to a kid for pain or something. And, you know, if you should stick to Tylenol or ibuprofen. It's probably not a good thing term that we use baby aspirin so commonly. This is just a funny thing I put on here. It's, um, I think it was something, I can't remember when they published this, like the Health and Human Services Department um, published this in like the 70s or 80s, and it's this little rhyme about not taking aspirin uh, for this guy. And, uh, it's kind of funny. Anyway, you can look at it if you want. Uh, all right, other medicines you should know, fluoroquinolone, so Cipro, Leviquin, Avalox, or Moxy, all your floxacins. You'll see this as a class effect um, and recommendations to avoid. You can use these in kids. In fact, um, generally, it might be a preferred option compared to some other things. But for the most part, if you can try something else, you're going to want to try a different antibiotic. So this would be like a, a third or fourth line at the, at the very earliest. Um, joint and tendon issues, they did a study where they gave these little beagles 100 milligram per kilo of Cipro daily for four weeks, and it caused degenerative changes in knee joints. So just for perspective, like we give people Cipro 500 milligrams twice a day, so 1,000 milligrams for an adult. So the dosing is, you know, astronomical compared to what we would do for a normal person. So that's one problem with this. We're dosing, this study was way higher, and also it's beagles. So do beagles have the exact same physiology as a human? No. Yeah. So um, at lower doses, like 30 mg per kg, which again is still quite high compared to what we would do, um, you see minimal effects. Um, Leviquin and other fluoroquinolones have been shown to cause inflammatory arthritic lesions. Clinically seeing this is very rare, and it seemed to be me what I see in observation or literature reports is um, case reports or cohort studies showing 
uh, this happening in elderly patients more so than kids, but uh, certainly it's something worth you know taking a step back and looking at. I'm not saying it's not an issue at all, uh, but for example, there was a study in 2002 that looked at 6,000 fluoroquinolone treated children and showed that incidence was comparable with azithromycin, which is not contraindicated in children whatsoever at any age group. So the <clears throat> idea that fluoroquinolones actually have a risk is probably quite low, and if you need to use them, it's generally accepted that you can. It's just try something else first is the recommendation. All right. Any questions on those topics before I move on to neonatal? Yeah. Just to follow up on that crypto for kids, it's just calcium carbonate. There's no. Oh, okay. So the kids yeah. specific one is calcium. Okay. So it's basically like Tums in liquid form, which makes it more confusing for people because certainly the adult one, if you mix them up. Uh, yeah. So always check your label. That's the moral of the story there. <laughs> All right. Neonatal disease. So I talked about pulmonary development being one of the big issues with kids. So most of the diseases we're going to talk about with neonates are going to be due to premature development and uh, poor lung function. And so this is just some markers of when the lungs develop. So 24 weeks is thought to be the most like viable lungs develop. The further along they are, the better their lungs are going to do. Um, you know, we can have kids really uh, little preemies below 24 weeks. So certainly a possibility and those kids are going to need a lot of uh, intensive care when it comes to pulmonary function but they can survive certainly um, with the right type of care. Uh, 24, 26 to 36 weeks you have the development of the true alveoli at about 32 weeks there. Gas exchange is possible and not, uh, not optimal. Development continues five to six months after term delivery. So the lungs still continue to develop and they're one of the last things if we want to say to fully develop to develop. And that's why we see so many pulmonary issues with our premature kids. Uh, so respiratory distress syndrome is the most common respiratory disorder. It's usually due, to, again, to immature lungs, and um, the issue is pulmonary surfactant deficiency, uh, incidence inversely proportional to gestational age at birth. So again, there you go as far as percentages go based on your uh, term delivery or how many weeks long you are at delivery. Um, surfactant deficiency causes inflammation in the lungs. You just don't have lubricant, right? So things, tissues rubbing against each other causing epithelial injury. Uh, oops, I skipped a slide. There we go. So um, I'll focus mostly on the prevention. You can try antenatal steroids like dexamethasone. Betamethasone is a really common one we give uh, moms IM at our hospital. It comes as a, you can give dexamethasone IV or IM or PO, but they give betamethasone IM. I think it's got more of a, um, a thick suspension to it, so it lasts a longer time. You don't have to redose it quite as frequently is why they prefer it. Uh, Betamethasone comes, it's more common as like a topical preparation, but it does come as this IM thing. So it is a very potent steroid. It's kind of one-to-one -one with dexamethasone, if you remember back to your steroid potencies. Um, that can promote lung cell pro proliferation. Any mother who is um, having a, a child, whether it be C-section or vaginal delivery or it, some sort of premature delivery, uh, less than 35 weeks, they'll be given uh, this product to uh, just in case help the lungs develop um, as much as possible. Treatment, uh, if the kid, uh, once the kid is delivered, if we want to treat, there are some surfactants on the market. Uh, there are a couple different ones, and honestly, I haven't done enough research into this lately. To I did a rotation at Children's a long time ago, uh, and they seem to always be going back and forth with different synthetic and natural products, but they are available. I think there is maybe a shortage of them as well, so I'm not sure what they use if they can't get it in. If they try just I don't know, some sort of nebulization program or something like that. Uh, but there are surfactants that have been on and off the market. Um, one thing you can get is pulmonary edema with the inflammation. So diuretics can be used. You can use furosemide. It's commonly used in children for uh, removing fluid. Um, nitric oxide is a gas that we can give and dilates the pulmonary vasculature. It's really expensive, but it does reduce pulmonary hypertension in these children and can prevent that um, uh, pulmonary edema picture from happening. So again, not a ton to do for drugs. Basically, the the mother the mother care is big for the steroids, and then really I would you know the diuretics or symptomatic relief. If you can get surfactants, that would be an option. Otherwise, um, you're looking at nebulization treatments. So keeping the airways open, trying nitric oxide, maybe using like an albuterol type product or something like that. Chronic lung disease. Uh, Oxygen required at 36 weeks gestation. Usually this is continuation of respiratory distress syndrome, um, higher association with low birth weight, uh, similar complications, similar causes. 
prevention. Uh, vitamin A, premature neonates tend to have low blood concentration, so this can prevent that if post, in the postpartum period giving vitamin A to the child. Uh, fluid restriction um, to help getting any uh, excess, to help preventing excess fluid from accumulating. Uh, surfactant and the other RDS treatments would apply here. Um, studies will show that once the kid gains weight at a normal rate, the incidence of chronic lung disease tends to taper off a bit. So adequate nutrition is really important. Drosomide again is important here. You can use thiazides as synergy. Remember that's back to our algorithm from last fall. Uh, you can when you're trying to get rid of fluid fast, our loop diuretics are preferred, and then the thiazides get added on for synergy. And you can use all the same drugs we use in adults and kids. Furosemide's the most well studied in kids, which is why it's used. You could use the other two as well. Dumetanide or torsemide would be fine. Uh, most places will probably stick to furosemide. Bronchodilators, uh, your inhaled albuterol, which is your um, beta, uh, short-acting beta agonist, or your um, ipratropium, which is your anticholinergic. Um, you can use both at the same time, the duoneb concept there. Electrolyte replacement as needed, glucocorticoids, um, usually not done unless it's a really severe inhalation with an inflammatory response that you want to suppress in the kid. And this would be in the child, not in the adult mother like we were talking about with the other slide. All right, another breathing thing, apnea of prematurity. So pause in breathing for more than 20 seconds or for more than 10 seconds with accompanying bradycardia, oxygen desaturation as well. Um, again, same uh, risk factors, similar causes. There's a mechanism for you with some other stuff there, but basically um, the underlying cause are usually related to um, some sort of congenital cardiac problem or some sort of uh, infection. Methylxanthines can control the symptoms of this. So methylxanthine, probably most people are familiar with caffeine as you know the most widely consumed methylxanthine on the planet. And the proposed mechanism for why these drugs work and why caffeine and, and analogs of it help with this is that they um, work on central GABA neurons and prevent GABA release, which causes some sort of mediated GABA uh, depression. Remember, or anything that's enhancing GABA's activities is causing an inhibitory effect in the central nervous system, and that's the idea behind this. It seems to selectively focus on GABA channels that cause um, respiratory effects, though, for some reason. So it's kind of a cool mechanism there. Um, two drugs, aminophilin and caffeine. They both come IV and PO. Caffeine's got a wider therapeutic range, less frequent dosing, less tachycardia. For a long time, IV caffeine, it still kind of does come on and off the market. It's not cheap. So, um, and yes, caffeine comes in an IV form for those of you guys who are interested. Um, you can get a prescription for that. Uh, amino, uh, <laughs> amino, uh, aminophilin is short acting and less expensive, but um, it's got higher toxicity associated with it too. So if dose to, okay, I think it depends on what people can get a hold of and what the costs are. If caffeine is somewhat affordable and available, it's preferred. If, amino, if it's astronomically priced and on off market, aminophilin will be the preferred choice for pediatric hospitals. Adverse effects, just like you'd expect any person getting a caffeine-like product, tachycardia, jitter, jitteriness, um, GI irritation, diuresis, glucose intolerance can all happen for the kids getting that. Okay, um, let's talk about neonatal-specific ID. So most susceptible to infections up to six weeks after birth. Natural killer cells are full, fully functional around 9 to 12 months. T and B lymphocytes develop around 15 to 19 weeks gestation. However, they're less experienced, right? They haven't come across a lot of things. Um, most things that we're concerned about, <clears throat> nosocomial infections, especially for premature kids, uh, tend to be more likely to get those opportunistic pathogen infections. Group B strep, if the mother's colonized, uh, one of the big ones there. Bacterial meningitis, which can be caused by group B strep or other bacteria. Uh, fungal infections potentially a little bit less common, but more common again in those premature kids who have even weaker immune systems. Um, and then some viruses. So HSV uh, would be uh, transmission related and so would HIV. So we try and of course screen people for these things. So HSV, HIV, group B, strep, those three should be you should be able to screen the mother for that and prophylax for that appropriately. If we treat mothers um, giving birth with HIV, it's almost a, a guarantee that we can't, we won't transmit there. We've gotten really good at avoiding that vertical transmission. HSV um, depends on if there's active lesions or not. You can prophylax with acyclovir IV, and you can give the kid acyclovir too. 
Um, group B strep, you can easily clear that with, um, we either use amoxicillin or we use cephalexin, um, clindamycin for people with allergies. So those would be the two areas, or the areas where we'd try our best to uh, prevent any type of infection from occurring. Let's talk about those nosocomial bugs, though. So our premature infants are at higher risk. Um, increased hospital length of stay, just like with adults, is going to increase your risk for some sort of uh, exposure to the nosocomial pathogens. Common bugs, again, group B strep isn't really nosocomial, but it's still thrown into here because it's uh, high risk for these patients. E. coli, enterococcus, um, Listeria, um, Haemophilus, and Staph aureus would be the ones that are most commonly seen in peds. Treatment options are relatively basic, um, ampicillin gentamicin or vancomycin gentamicin, and really the difference between why you'd pick an AMP gent regimen or a vancomycin gentamicin regimen would be the staph aureus. So if they have staph growing, we're probably going to start treating with vanco until we can eliminate what? MRSA, right? So once we know that there's no MRSA, um, you could switch to an ampicillin or gent, or it depends on how the patient's responding to. Um, treat them empirically, so anybody with uh, any kid with a fever or um, anything growing on a gram stain any, immediately, you'd probably want to treat them quickly. Nosocomial bacteria doesn't necessarily mean sepsis, but it can proceed to sepsis quite quickly. It can proceed to meningitis and other things like pneumonia as well, so we want to treat it aggressively if we can catch it quickly. Group B strep, again, colonized mothers can cause vertical transmission. Prematurity, male sex, and multiple births all increase risk. Uh, so group B strep can lead to a lot of things like meningitis, bacteremia, cellulitis, cellulitis uh, or osteomyelitis in some cases, and pneumonias. Treatment, basic penicillin and ampicillin works great for group B strep. Uh, if you have uh, a kid who has any of these things, you're probably going to add gentamicin on board for gram negatives until you can rule it out. Why do we use gent in kids? It's a good question that I'm thinking of myself right now, and maybe you guys are thinking of too. If you remember back to our ID lecture, gent, it's kind of a no-go in, in adults because it causes renal damage. In kids, we don't see the issue as much, and um, there's a lot of good evidence for using gent in pediatric patients. So do all hospitals still use gent? Have they switched to third generation cephalosporins maybe, but I'll talk about some of the issues with those here in a second. Um, if you have a penicillin allergy, clindamycin is recommended as an alternative. Um, and really it depends on the source of infection for dosing. If somebody has a bloodstream infection or a central nervous system infection, the dosing is going to be quite a bit higher than if they have a pneumonia. Uh, meningitis, vertical transmission is the most common cause. So again, group B strep, 50% of cases. Um, e. coli and listeria would be the other ones. If you remember back to our meningitis uh, algorithm, the little kids get the um, E. coli. Uh, kind of comes into play with little kids and older adults as well. So we do the same types of treatment, so AMP plus gentamicin. If you wanted to use a third generation cephalosporin, cefotaxime is used. We don't use our favorite drug in adults, ceftriaxone, because it can cause some biliary sludge buildup, which can lead to a conicterous type picture. Uh, in kids, it's not super well understood. I can't remember. I think I've got the age cut off on one of these slides coming up here. But if you do want a third gen cephalosporin as an alternative to your um, to your gentamicin, cefotaxime is a preferred drug in really little kids. Once you get older, ceftriaxone can be used just fine. The reason why cefotaxime is not preferred in adults is because you dose it three times a day versus ceftriaxone is a once daily med. So basically, when you're looking at this type of regimen, you're really covering the same bugs here. It would be, you know, if you had preference for one over the other, cefotaxime um, might be better tolerated on the kidneys versus gentamicin. So if you had some kidney issues, you might want to consider avoiding the aminoglycosides altogether. Uh, staph is quite rare, but it's possible. Um, for meningitis, it's really odd to see staph, but again, vancomycin would be your drug of choice if that was the case. 14 to 21 days of treatment. So it's a long extended treatment course, probably a long hospitalization for kids with bacterial meningitis. Other infections, not super important because they're unusual and specialized and a little bit rare. So fungal infections. <clears throat> um, if you do have a fungal infection, you treat it similar to how we treat an adult. You usually start with fluconazole, which we can give IV. Very basic anti azole antifungal covers your standard candida, which is usually what kids will get. Kids usually don't get the really odd, you know, additional species of candida or um, things like aspergillus. Certainly possible. But for an initial infection, you're probably looking at basic candida albicans for most, and that's usually a vertical transmission type thing as well. 
HSV, uh, <clears throat> again, you can get IV acyclovir, which works very well, very effective for HSV and very safe in kids. Um, and HIV, we talked about this already, pre-medding these patients. So Zidavidine comes as an IV product, and you can give that um, pre, intra, and postpartum uh, for six weeks. And again, it's very successful at preventing vertical transmission. I think George talked about this in his lecture, maybe. And he always prides himself in, in Hennepin County's care and says, I don't think they've had a vertical transmission case in decades. And they um, do a ton of high-risk HIV positive pregnancies. Well, relatively speaking, right? Maybe not a ton, but, you know, compared to my hospital, which doesn't do any. Um, all right, other neonatal diseases. Let's talk about any questions on the ID stuff before I kind of move on to some of the other oddballs. Not necessarily oddballs, but if you haven't done peds, all this stuff might sound kind of odd. Uh, patent ductus arteriosus, or PDA. So the ductus arteriosus diverts blood uh, from the lungs of the fetus while they aren't being used. Um, large PDAs lead to poorly oxygenated blood available in the heart, causing heart failure, hypertension, and arrhythmia. So usually that PDA closes up, um, but if it doesn't, uh, what do you do? There's a couple ways um, you can try treating this. First of all, small PDAs may be asymptomatic, and patients might not even, you might not even know that the kid has one because they aren't having any issues with their circulation. Um, in some cases, you might want to actually keep uh, some, you can aggressively close the, the PDA um, with medications or surgery, depending on uh, how big it is or how, many, how much symptoms they're having. So prostaglandins keep the DA uh, patent. So if you give ibuprofen or indomethacin to cut down your prostaglandin production, that's a simple way to do it, and that can, over time, help close the, the, um, the ductus arteriosus naturally. Only really helpful for a preterm kid. If you're full term and you have a large um, a PDA, you're probably not going to get much benefit from the uh, NSAID therapy, so that's probably a surgical intervention at that point. Other diseases, um, necrotizing enterocolitis, or neck, is inflammation of the intestine or colon, may lead to a perforated bowel and more of an intra-abdominal infection picture, um, likely due to ischemia. Premature infants are at higher, high risk for this. This can be, just like an adult intra-abdominal infection, quite serious and have a lot of different pathogens involved, so we treat broad spectrum. So our broad spectrum choices should sound very familiar to last fall. Zosin, uh, some sort of a uh, primaxin uh, used in kids a lot, but any carbapenem is probably fine. Or uh, cefepime, so an advanced generation cephalosporin plus uh, metronidazole to cover the anaerobes. So remember, cefepime itself doesn't really cover anaerobes. It's very broad spectrum otherwise, uh, but you have to add the flagell on. So that's a big difference there. And anytime you're dealing with GI perforations or GI anything infectious, you want to cover your um, bacteroides, which is where um, either those combination drugs come in or metronidazole does a good job at that. All right, so that's neonatal. Drawing a line. Ready for peds? This is going to be a, uh, older kids. Um, so again, if you work <coughs> like a general urgent care, a general ED, family practice or pediatric or general pediatric clinic, you're going to see this a lot more commonly than the stuff we just talked about, which is really limited to neonatal intensive care. All right, croup, uh, inflammation of the area just below the larynx. So your common causes for this are mostly viral. Um, it's mid-autumn and odd years tends to be the trend, which is really bizarre. Who knows? Um, children seven months to three years, usually not seen if you're old, over six years. If your kid has some kind of a cough and they're above three to six years, maybe croup, less likely. Over six, probably not. Um, barking cough with inspiratory strider and hoarseness, sort of the hallmark of croup. People always say it sounds like a croupy cough, which isn't necessarily a total diagnostic feature in and of itself, but you know, people use that a lot. Uh, Treatment, pretty basic. Fluids, acetaminophen if you have a fever, cold humidifiers, um, getting away from tobacco smoke or any um, items that have come in contact with tobacco smoke. So like jackets, clothing, um, cars, stuff like that. Um, dexamethasone is given for this. So we give actually pretty high doses, 0.6 mg per kg PO, which ends up like, for example, if an adult came in in... It's a good example of this. Uh, like um, asthma attack, we might give them 10 milligrams of dexamethasone. Well, you could see that um, for a decent sized kid, like, I don't know, 15 kilos, you're already pushing kind of an adult dose there. So you do actually end up going, I've given kids like 15, 16 milligrams of dexamethasone in one shot before. Um, it's pretty common to do that. So don't worry about the dosing being a little bit higher. Remember, kids metabolize faster, and that's the studied dose. So 
Um, dexamethasone, just as a tip, if you work in this area, this uh, the dexamethasone product that comes orally is like this um, alcohol solution, and it tastes really bad. It's supposed to be really bitter. It's like 30% ethanol, um, so um, kids, <laughs> kids aren't really going to like it a whole lot, I don't think. Uh, what we do instead is we use the IV product, which comes as a 10 milligram per one mil vial, and you can shoot that into like applesauce or juice or something and have the kid drink it, and they won't really notice the taste of it. Then. So that's the product we prefer, and that's pretty common. So in case you're wondering why we're we using this IV vial for oral, Remember, you can, you can swallow anything IV. It's just not built for that. But it's still, if it gets into the GI tract, it'll absorb normally. Oh, and then um, racemic epinephrine is something that's used nebulized occasionally. So that can cause some local uh, vasoconstrictive thing um, in, the, in the airways to help uh, reduce some inflammation that way. Acute bronchiolitis, lower respiratory tract infection, usually caused by RSV, so it's viral. Um, children less than two years old, usually you're looking at like November to April, like cold season, um, pretty much uh, going to look very similar to a common cold, but with maybe a little bit more severe um, presentation. So fever, uh, comorbid otitis media, treatment, supportive care, hydration, um, uh, epinephrine, racemic epinephrine uh, and hyper sa hypertonic saline nebs. Hypertonic saline nebs just um, cause a different concentration gradient and can help lubricate the lungs. Um, glucocorticoids are usually not used for this. It's a big difference between this and croup. Um, ribavirin nebs. So there is a nebulized antiviral product called ribavirin, and it could be rarely, rarely used if somebody was severely ill with this, maybe to the point where they're hospitalized or intubated because of it, but um, we don't use it routinely. Prevention. Um, RSV has an IgG, so it has an immune globulin product out there called pal palavizumab or Synagis is the brand name. So for kids who have history of this potentially or high risk for whatever reason, like if they're premature, um, they might be given this once a month. It's really expensive and I don't know if the evidence is really in favor of using it or not, uh, but it is an option out there for a preventative course. Uh, pertussis is whooping cough caused by the bacteria Bordetella pertussis. Uh, usually, kids less than six months old who haven't been vac or haven't been vaccinated. So, the pertussis vaccine sequence starts around six months, and so um, you're going to see it in those little kids or then or people who have not vaccinated their children for pertussis. Um, adults and adolescent patients may have waning immunity. We actually had a case of this. Uh, well, uh, this is a few years ago, but um, a bunch of ER personnel and even some of our physicians got sick with pertussis because your immunity eventually fades, but most people don't ever get exposed to it enough where they get sick from it. Um, so anyway, just some fun fact there. Um, upper respiratory infection, cough, strider, usually no fever, may lead to uh, apnea and pneumonia. Uh, treatment, azithromycin is the most common drug of choice for this. It works very well for Bordetella. Uh, Bactrim could be used as an alternative uh, only if your kid is over two months though. Um, not effective for symptoms after the cough is established, but it reduces the spread of the disease, so that's important. If you want your kid to get back to daycare or school, they probably need about 24 hours on the antibiotic before they can go uh, back and not be contagious. It does spread very quickly, uh, so you do want to make sure your kid's out of school and getting antibiotics once it's identified. Pneumonia um, may appear similar to bronchiolitis, but a more severe version of this. Um, Highest incidence of pediatric death worldwide. Vaccines look like uh, the biggest uh, help we have to prevent this. So pneumococcal, um, H. influenzae, and your general uh, yearly flu shot are going to cut down on a big amount of those cases. But still have other bugs. Um, group B strep, so if the patient, uh, again, was exposed to this in the womb um, or for some reason picked it up. E. coli um, and listeria are the ones. Otherwise, atypicals can affect kids as well and uh, viral sources like influenza and other respiratory viruses. Uh, most common sense when narrowing possible infectious source. So did your daycare kid, your kid's daycare friend have the same thing? That would be maybe were they in a hospital? Did they travel somewhere? That would be maybe where you could narrow it down. But ultimately, there might not be enough uh, history to go on. Um, viral, so with HSV or cytomegalovirus, birth to 30 days, you can use acyclovir. Um, influenza, if you're over one year, you can use Tamiflu, and some pediatric hospitals might use it in kids under that, but that's where it's approved for. Um, Community-acquired pneumonia, so bacterial pneumonia for birth to 30 days, AMP and GENT, we already talked about that. One to six months, generally you're still going to hospitalize them. 
Uh, with inpatients, you could consider cefotaxime, maybe azithromycin added on for atypical coverage. Outpatient, six to five years old. This is the majority of the cases we're going to see probably. Um, amoxicillin high dose is really all you need. It's going to cover most of the pathogens you're going to see quite well. Atypicals are pretty rare in kids. That would be the one area you aren't. But it's going to cover your listeria and your, <coughs> your group B strep and, and those types of things. And uh, even strep pneumo for those kids sometimes. Um, let's see. You don't really need azithromycin, but you could potentially if you wanted to. Again, we talked about ceftonir. Um, ceftonir is a third generation cephalosporin, so if you wanted additional coverage, you could do that. Um, kids this old could maybe get a shot of ceftriaxone IM if you wanted to give them something injectable. That'd be an option too. Inpatient treatment's a little bit more aggressive, but pretty much the same thing. Usually you're just going to give IV versions, so IV ampicil and IV cefotaxime instead of the PO equivalents. Um, yeah, azithromycin, again, plus or minus, you usually probably don't need it. Um, over five years old, amoxicillin plus or minus azithromycin. You can also consider fluoroquinolones for these kids if they have severe disease. Uh, meningococcal disease, uh, talking about, we already talked about um, meningitis a little bit. Uh, the difference here with older kids is you're going to use vancomycin and cefotaxime slash ceftriaxone. And that's really all I want to talk about with that. So it gets pretty close to the same thing as your adult disease um, with respect to uh, central nervous system infections in kids. The only difference is those really little neonates use ampicillin. You don't really need vanco for them. That's the big difference between the two groups. Again, Central nervous system infections are quite rare, but it's good to know the general gist of it, but it's not like the most important thing probably for most of us to understand because we rarely ever see it. Uh, UTIs, uh, super common, especially in girls, but uh, higher prevalence if the boys are under one year. Um, if you want to compare uh, stats, um, UTIs are quite rare in boys to begin with. You compare them to girls, but about eight to nine times higher in uncircumcised boys versus circumcised boys. So that's part of your diagnostic criteria and looking for an infectious source if they're uncircumcised. That's usually a, a bigger red flag for a possible UTI. Um, untreated can lead to ser serious kidney damage. So whereas with adults, you usually can clear a UTI relatively quickly, um, with even if you're not treated. I mean, it might not be the best idea in the world, but most adults aren't going to progress to like a systemic pyelonephritis illness or like a pyelonephritis or something like that. Kids can, can have a lot more serious complications with them. So we treat them pretty aggressively. The bugs are pretty much the same as what we'd see in adults. E. coli uh, being the major cause, enterococcus, and uh, also pseudomonas sometimes seen in kids more commonly than adults. Under two, nonspecific presentation. Treatment, um, if you're less than two months, you're going to be admitted for IV antibiotics. Over two months, PO therapy might be okay. Usually go straight to a third generation cephalosporin for these to make sure we basically have a 100% chance of covering the E. coli. Uh, so ceftonir is really commonly used. Again, it tastes really good. I think it's a once a day regimen too. It might be twice a day, but I think there's a, a once a day regimen with that too. Other third generation cephalosporin, cefixime, ceftibutin, they all have excellent like 99% rates of E. coli coverage. So you don't really have to worry about missing anything. And that's the idea here. We aren't as willing to take a 10% risk with a kid than we are with an adult. Um, some other things that might be okay, Augmentin, Cephalexin, Bactrim, uh, probably all fine, but just worsening resistance. So usually the recommendation is to go with the third gen in a child. Um, if you did have Pseudomonas growing in the culture, Cipro would be preferred. That's the only oral, Merfluoroquinolones are the only oral drugs we have access to that cover Pseudomonas. So if that's your drug in your urine and you don't want to, and they're sick enough to admit, um, you have to use the fluoroquinolone. So kind of run into those issues where that's not necessarily recommended because of the tendon thing, but in this case, it's the only choice you have. Uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome is the most common cause of acute renal failure in kids under 10. It's usually due to a shiga or shiga-like toxin producing bacteria associated with community outbreaks. So this is a um, uh, pathogen that colonizes or gets into the GI tract, um, causes some sort of um, uh, hemolytic-related diarrhea. So you have bloody diarrhea, bloody stools usually from a contaminated animal product, so undercooked meat. 15% uh, incidence if infected, 85% will resolve spontaneously in 10 days, but we still, um, 
want to support the kid as best as we can and watch their symptoms. What happens is the to toxins get into the systemic circulation and then they can attack the kidneys, which causes uh, damage to that specific organ system. It's an inflammatory response that there's not a whole lot you can do. The treatment's supportive, so you get fluids and electrolytes and dialysis. So the only reason I'm talking about this a lot is because you don't give antibiotics. So if you have these specific hemorrhagic strains, just like with adults, if you gave an antibiotic, it, it cleaves the bacteria, right, and you can leak out the toxins more so, so you can actually contribute to the problem. That's why with some of these, um, like a an infectious diarrhea or suspicion of infectious diarrhea, you want to wait for your stool culture to come back before you prescribe your antibiotic. Uh, don't do it prophylactically because if it comes back, or don't do it uh, empirically, I should say, if it comes back with this growing, you've done more harm than good with that particular product. All right, ID questions? Talk about vaccines and then we'll take a quick break. Well, yeah, I think, I mean, I think this, if you want to review some of the more detailed stuff, I think the slides will be mostly what you need. I'll focus on the regimens. I might ask you a little bit about the pathogens too that I've talked about today. But yeah, if you need, feel like you need more of a refresher on mechanisms or things like that, maybe go back. Uh, but I won't, I won't be asking antibiotics out of the ones I just covered, if that helps. Okay, vaccines. I'm not going to make you memorize a lot of vaccines or schedules or anything like that. I just want you to know a couple little things about vaccines. So let's talk about vaccines so everyone's on the same page. Um, uh, purpose of vaccination, so we want to stimulate our active immune system to respond to specific antigen. Uh, vaccines <clears throat> have to be antigenic but not pathogenic, so that's the difference between causing disease and preventing the disease. Goal, develop antibodies against specific infectious pathogen without causing harm to your patients, and success rates of vaccines are, vaccines are widely accepted to be one of the greatest inventions in modern medicine with the exception of maybe clean water supply. Um, so certainly very impactful on our current practices. Um, types of vaccines, you've got live attenuated, inactivated, toxoids, polysaccharides, surface antigens. I don't care if you know any of these, exception of a live attenuated because there's some slight differences with that. The reason is, is because um, they're contraindicated in immunosuppressed people, so pregnant patients, um, generally immunosuppressed patients, so people um, who maybe have a transplant, people who have um, uh, chemotherapy, stuff like that, uh, and very young children might have contraindications to them as well. So the reason why I care, well, I'll talk about those specifically here in a second. Let's talk about the vaccine schedule. So if you're ever wanting to schedule somebody or know how to do a catch-up schedule or whatever it might be, um, the CDC has any type of algorithm you could possibly want. And no one really, unless you do this on a daily basis, probably has this stuff memorized. So um, I wouldn't ask you to memorize it by any means. But just simply know that the CDC has a good recommendation. This is something I just pulled from up to date a while ago about um, just indications of schedule. So usually they show you, for example, um, like you give hepatitis B right away. That's the first vaccine most kids will get. It's recommended to give the day of birth. Why? Because if a kid's likely to get hepatitis B early in life, it's probably going to be in the hospital where they are most likely to get exposed to some sort of bloodborne pathogen. Super rare to get hepatitis B from the hospital, but if the kid's going to get it, probably going to be in the hospital. So that's why that one's given right away. Um, the rest of them usually start at about two months and then go up from there. You can see the different schedules there. Most of you guys are probably somewhat familiar with this. Um, this would be recommended vaccination, vaccinations for adults. So just something to point out, um, influenza vaccine, for example, uh, you might see some things in here like uh, for pregnancy and immunocompromised patients, contraindications. You notice the influenza vaccine has no contraindications at all. If you give um, the influenza vaccine, um, there's multiple forms of it. There is a live attenuated form that's contraindicated in pregnancy. However, the standard vaccine we give has no contraindications to it, really, unless you've had like a severe reaction to it. And even then, there's alternatives to it. So it's not a lot of excuses for not getting the flu shot. All right, so the live vaccines. I would like you to know the common live vaccines. I think it's an important thing just to have in the back of your mind. Um, and they're going to be the intranasal influenza vaccine. So that's the flu mist product. Um, Zoster, or Zostavax, MMR, and Varicella. So when you hear about live vaccines or people can't take certain vaccines because of their immune system, it's going to be these ones. There are some other oddballs out there, uh, but these are going to be the common ones that are part of the schedule or yearly recommendations. 
in, in the Plumist, I guess it would be an alternative to the yearly recommendation, but it is an option. Every once in a while I get people asking me, like are doctors calling the pharmacy or talking to me personally and saying, oh, I've heard that the Plumist has better coverage rates this year. Should I get that instead of the injectable one or the regular one? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the Plumist has also has some issues with it where it doesn't necessarily absorb as well or might not get as much um, antigenic contact with, uh, with your immune system. But some years they might say that the Plumist is more beneficial. I don't know. I've never seen any concrete evidence to support one over the other. I think, you know, if you can't, if you really don't want the shot and you want to get the flu mist, go for it. But the shot's probably just fine for most people. All right, so what are the real contraindications or precautions to vaccines? Anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is unpredictable. Whenever we give a medicine, there's always a risk of anaphylaxis. And vaccines are no different. Um, some components may be indicative. So like if you have an egg allergy, that's a common <laughs> one. They use eggs to help. Um, develop or in the production process of the vaccine. So you might be exposed to some of those proteins in the final product. It's possible you could react to that if you have a history of egg allergies. That's why they always ask you about egg allergies, especially when you get the flu vaccine. Immunodeficiency in pregnancy. Uh, remember, this is the one where you want to avoid those live vaccines. Um, immunosuppressive therapy, if short term, so like if you're going through a chemotherapy cycle, especially for a pediatric patient, hold off the vaccine until it's done and then give them a catch up after that. Um, response, that should say response is not as good, sorry. Response is not as good. You could give it to somebody who's slightly immunosuppressed, but if your immune system's suppressed, you can't react to the, to the product. It's not necessarily that it's going to hurt you per se, but we wanna make sure somebody has a fully functional immune system. The only ones that could possibly cause damage are the live attenuated. For the non-live products, um, they aren't going to cause any issues to an immunosuppressive person. They're just going to basically be given like a placebo where it's not going to give, the immune system's not available to react to that specific antigen. Um, acute illness. <clears throat> the reason why they recommend to hold off during acute illness until the illness has passed. Uh, fever, uh, if you have a, a, fever, a febrile illness, it could mask allergic reaction symptoms potentially. So you might not know you're having some sort of an anaphylactic response. Also with the immune system already ramped up, it could lead to potential attack on the particles designed to build immunity, sorry, immunity and therefore decrease efficacy. Uh, that would be just like your immune system kind of going overboard and destroying whatever particles you give, and then you don't really get the, the sustained memory effect. So that's a theory. It's not necessarily proven, but um, that's the really. So um, again, my big message here is when it comes to true contraindication, it really has to do with live vaccines and immunodeficiency. Uh, or conditions causing immunodeficiency. Other than that, there's not a lot of uh, direct contraindications to giving uh, a vaccination to somebody. All right, uh, my, my little soapbox. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir, at least I kind of hope I am. I think that anti-vaxxers are a very small amount of people in the country, but they kind of have a loud voice, which is annoying. Um, back around to, to the whole link of autism, just so you guys know, in case you don't. Um, autism scare started in 1998. Uh, a guy named Andrew Wakefield, I won't do him the service of calling him a doctor because he got his medical license stripped, um, published a paper in Lancet, uh, which is a highly respected medical journal, right? Um, there's a sample size of 12 children that showed MMR vaccine could ultimately lead to brain damage. Uh, Lancet then retracted the paper due to a discovered manipulation of data and fraudulent research, and Wakefield was stripped of his medical license in the UK. Um, since then, there's been a huge chain reaction of people trying to follow up to see if there's any truth to what he published, uh, and there's been no ep epidemiological comparisons or studies to back up his claims. There's been a lot. This horse has been beaten dead multiple times, and no one's found any link to autism, so I think we can let this one rest very safely. Uh, but Wakefield, for some reason, doesn't like going away, and um, why he's not in jail is beyond me, because I think his damage to the public health community is massive. Uh, but he uh, continues to be a rallying figure. They seem He seems to pop up here and there at anti-vax rallies and things like that. And again, why, why he still is a public figure, I don't know. Um, the impact of this, uh, again, chain reaction. So celebrities have endorsed these things. And I kind of get it from one perspective. You know, you have people who have autistic children, and they want to know why, like, like, I'm struggling with my autistic kid. If I could figure out what caused the autism, then maybe other parents could, could prevent autism in the future. And so noble cause in theory, but it's very misdirected at vaccines. Uh, one of the things that it's a little bit of a hot-button topic that comes up is thimerosal, which is a mercury-based preservative. 
um, considered by vaccine critics as a neurotoxic culprit. And why I say considered by vaccine culprits is because it's not actually proven to be a neurotoxic culprit. In fact, very likely doesn't really get into the central nervous system in any appreciable amount. Um, there's other types of vac uh, mercury that might get in. So there's ethyl mercury and, and anyway, different ones, not worth going into. Um, but people said, well, maybe it's the thimerosal because mercury is a neurotoxin, just not in this particular form. Um, so that's been researched as well, and they haven't been shown any link to thimerosal. However, vaccine companies did one step further, like, all right, we'll just take thimerosal out of vaccines. And basically no vaccines ever um, have had thimerosal in them to begin with. The only ones that still do are multi-dose. So sometimes you'll see like a, I don't know, a multi-dose vial of flu vaccine. So you can get like 10 doses out of it versus the individual syringes. And so like a community pharmacy might buy these because they're cheaper per dose. So they might save some money on it. Um, and that would have thimerosal in it as a preservative. But generally the vast majority of vaccines, especially if they're single dose, don't have preservative in them. And uh, the interesting thing about all this is the MMR vaccine, which Wakefield originally studied, wasn't, or SETI studied, um, wasn't, uh, never contained any thimerosal to begin with. So the whole connection to it is just sort of a wild goose chase that never really panned out into anything. But again, it's not really a big deal anymore because it's basically removed. Um, some other common concerns that might come up in culture, popular culture or discussion that haven't really been scientifically validated or proven or in fact disproven in most cases. Um, the vaccine overload concept, uh, there's concern that the immune system becomes weakened and overwhelmed if you give too many vaccine at once um, or that by giving a lot of vaccines in a short period of time, you increase the risk of exposing the child to anaphylaxis. Um, some, a guy named Robert Sears published a book with an alternative vaccine schedule, uh, which was basically recommending spreading out the current schedule to avoid this particular problem. The thing is, is that this isn't a problem. This has never been proven. There's never been any studies to show that increasing vaccine exposures increases anaphylaxis risk. There's never been a single study that shows that you overwhelm the immune system by giving four vaccines versus five. It simply doesn't exist as a problem. And he came up with this book and convinced a lot of people they need to follow it. Again, it's totally bogus. Um, there is some issues where, like, for example, there was a case settled with the CDC and um, something called the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, which is a government program that um, exists to compensate people financially for people who have had issues with um, vaccine anaphylaxis or unpredictable side effects. And a girl who's in South her encephalopathy worse, uh, worsened following administration of multiple vaccines. Can't link that to, to the vaccine. They simply can't. They've tried. It's one case out of you know how many, and there's simply no no proof that that's what caused it. Why it happened, I don't think we may ever know. But that they did compensate her because there wasn't really a direct cause that they could link it to other than the vaccine. So they just well, you can't say no, you can't say yes, but there isn't a smoking gun there. Um, some interesting things to consider. Infant immune system, think about uh, a new child and what they're being exposed to constantly and how many different things are in the air that we're constantly getting experienced with, especially a new baby. And the amount of uh, uh, activity our, our immune system can handle has never been fully quantified. It's a fact you could likely respond to multiple different things at once. So the fact that you're spreading up the, the injection cycle is more or less a convenience thing based on giving kids shots. And then there's also... The, the idea that certain diseases aren't relevant earlier in life and maybe more relevant, you know, two, three years in, or, you know, you don't need to start a certain vaccine cycle until a certain number of months because you really don't see kids exposed to that particular disease. Um, spreading out the, again, spreading it out is just fixing a problem that, that's not a big concern. I'll show you something about the Haemophilus influenzae vaccine and some of the trends on it, and just, I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, people get concerned about aluminum, saying that's a neurotoxin or some kind of a problem with it. It's used as an adjuvant to bolster immune response that's in vaccines in very small amounts. Uh, most people would agree that infants will ingest aluminum from dietary supplements, breast milk, formula, whatever, in trace amounts and will get more absorption systemically than they will in vaccines. Whether that's true, I don't entirely know if that's fully been studied either, but the point is, is that the, vac the aluminum component in a vaccine is tiny and the, the risk of it is very, very small. So when talking to people about these concerns, I just really think it's important that if you do work in a clinic or a setting where you're giving vaccines, that you know some of the history behind this. If you want more information, the CDC goes through all this in really good detail. It's very patient-friendly language. I know some people who might be 
more in the vaccine, anti-vaccine camp might be hesitant to believe anything the CDC says to begin with. So that's maybe one problem. But if you as their healthcare provider can translate some of that over and say, well, I've actually read into some of the studies myself or things like that, I'm certainly, it, it's going to have a big impact, hopefully, on the child's life or pre potentially prevent a negative impact on their life. And I think it's important. So, all right. Oh, uh, what about Big Pharma? They just have to make money. Uh, vaccines are profitable, just like anything a company makes. They wouldn't make it if they couldn't make money on it. But um, compared to like a once daily peel pill, it's not, it's an expensive product to make. Merck and maybe one other company, GSK, I think are the only two that actually make vaccines because other companies don't want to get into the business. It's really pricey to do it. And R&D isn't great, uh, great as far as like a return on investment. Um, but if we think about things like how many diseases are prevented from vaccines, um, you're probably saving billions of healthcare dollars down the road by investing a couple hundred bucks up front with a vaccination. So um, even conservative ec economic models show that vaccines are worth the cost initially. All right, Haemophilus influenza type B. So um, incidence of invasive HIV infection uh, was one of the most common sources of bacterial disease and meningitis in children less than five. One in 200 children would develop invasive HIV, and 66% of them were under 18 months old. The vaccine was developed in the late, I should say late, sorry, uh, late 1980, uh, 1980s, and they started trending data a little bit after that as far as the cases. And once the vaccine got common spread, we saw a complete drop in HIV, uh, sorry, HIV, HIV disease. Um, and so as far as cases currently, you have an average of 2,562 per year with 398 involving children ages under five. And before that, it was very much the flip case. Now we're seeing unvaccinated adults um, or people who have waning immunity getting the disease or older adults uh, versus kids. So um, the impact of this has been huge as far as preventing meningitis, preventing bacteremial complications. And uh, one of the things, just to go back to spreading out uh, uh, injection cycle, is if you delay HIV, for example, as a vaccine and you say, well, let's not give this at six months, let's give it at a year. That's six more months that kid possibly has to get exposed to it. And that's a really vulnerable area. And that's actually one of the recommendations in Sears book. So um, the whole point of it is that uh, it's dangerous to think that way, that you can just ignore certain diseases and say, well, it's probably not a high risk because there's always a risk. Even if you delay it a month or a week, you know, that's just putting your kid at risk unnecessarily for really no reason at all. So that's, again, my soapbox with that whole delayed schedule, because I think some parents might recognize the importance of vaccines, but get on board with the whole, let's delay it out, it's too much at once type of a thing. And that's the real, real danger with that. All right, now I think finally, let's talk about herd immunity quick. So protecting those most vulnerable, I think this is probably the most powerful argument for vaccines, personally for me. Um, is herd immunity. So we have pay people among us who can't take vaccines because they're immunocompromised, they're too young, they're whatever the reason might be. Um, herd immunity is designed to isolate those people, right? So if we have a whole bunch of people and um, you know, you've got, let's say, 5% of the population can't get vaccinated or I don't know, maybe you got one person out of 100. Um, the idea is that those other 99 people don't get the illness and therefore they don't come in contact, or even if they come in contact with that one person who can't get vaccinated, they can't spread the illness to them. Um, if you have 20% of the population saying, I don't need the vaccine, like the like let's say the seasonal flu shot, because um, you know other people get it or I never get sick or whatever, uh, then that's one more person likely to pass uh, a mild case of influenza on to an immunocompromised person that could end up being a severe case. So um, the idea of herd immunity, think about it as insulation of our most vulnerable people. And uh, when it fails, those are the people that get, get hurt. It's not the healthy people that get hurt. So I think like, you know, if you ultimately want the argument, what about a child with leukemia who has no immune system who can't get an MMR vaccine? Are you really going to risk exposing that kid because of a personal belief that's not founded in science? And that's where I get really passionate. And that's where I think that the ultimate argument, just there's no argument against that, that you can say that makes any sense. So again, that's my soapbox and I'll step off of it for the rest of the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's take a quick uh, five minute break or so and come back. We'll finish up. Too bad. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, first line, anyway, uh, ACE inhibitor or dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, uh, just like we would for our standard 
patients who are adults. Thiazide diuretics and beta blockers, kind of second line for kids. In adults, remember all three slash four, if you count ARBs as a separate one, are first line. In kids, thiazides have a little bit less data, um, so that's why they're a bit second line. But any, any of them are probably okay. Just like an adult, though, I'd prefer to start here and then go here second. So same thing in kids. Uh, pulmonary hypertension is something that can be a uh, more common complication in pediatric patients, especially if they have the congenital heart defects. So whereas with adults, it's idiopathic. We don't necessarily know what's going on. For kids, there's usually a cause of it. Now, again, kind of like the heart failure picture, we can hopefully reverse some of that with surgical interventions. And once they get the, the problem corrected, they shouldn't have persistent hypertension on the pulmonary side. However, certainly you can see it in newborns who have um, some uh, disease going on. Uh, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension is more rare in uh, the average kid, but it is possible as well. Treatment, um, inpatient nitric oxide, dopamine, dobutamine, and milrinone. Inotropic support is usually the core here. Outpatient is similar to how we treat kids. Um, calcium channel blockers, um, PDE5 inhibitors like sildenafil. I'll talk about that next week uh, more in detail. And then endothelial receptor blockers like we talk about with adults. I'm not going to test you on pediatric pulmonary hypertension, so don't worry about that. I just wanted to mention it. All right. Any questions on cardiology stuff? I just want you to know the basics of blood pressure management in kids and that it's the same as adults. If you know your adult, which you should before you go on rotations, um, you should know your kids' stuff pretty well. So. And then the anotropic support post-surgery. Okay. Um, just some general kind of pediatric cleanup topics. General pain management. Don't assume that kids' nervous systems are too immature to experience pain, that kids will have no memory of pain, and that kids will become easily addicted to narcotics. Um, basically, the, the reason I'm saying this is you shouldn't assume that you shouldn't treat childhood pain. Um, pain needs to be routinely assessed and treated appropriately, just like you would an adult patient, especially if you're looking at post-op care or um, any type of syndrome that the kid has that's causing pain. Obviously, the dose is going to be lighter, and you don't want to string your kid out on narcotics just like you would an adult, but appropriate pain management is appropriate pain management, regardless of the age of the patient. Um, treatment options are the exact same for adults. So Tylenol and ibuprofen, NSAIDs work great in kids. Um, opioids are fine to use. Topical stuff that we talk about is okay, like lidocaine, things like that. Numbing agents work well. Um, so consider all that stuff. Um, don't don't write anything off because it's just for adults. There's really nothing as far as analgesics go that you can't really use in, in the average child uh, for pain. And the same practice would apply for acute or chronic pain. You want to avoid opioids as much as possible. Try other things. And if you need to go to the opioids, they're available for you. Um, all right. So I do want you to know these two doses up here for the exam. I just think they're so common and they apply to so many things, especially if you work in any type of urgent care or pediatric clinic, you're going to see so many childhood fevers that you're going to want to know this right off the top of your head. Uh, and how many people have friends or have kids, have friends who have kids or have kids themselves, probably raise their hand, almost everybody, I assume. Um, I feel like I get asked this all the time by people, um, even some people I don't know that well. Um, how do you dose acetaminophen or ibuprofen? Can I give them both at the same time? So I just think it's really important general knowledge for people to have. So anyway, the dosing is pretty much the same for both of them. Uh, 10 to 15 mg per kg for the acetaminophen, 5 to 10 mg per kg per dose for ibuprofen. So the 10 mg per kilo is in the middle and crosses over there. Um, you can use naproxen and ketorolac in kids as well. Um, less than six months, there's some recommendations. You might have read on an ibuprofen bottle not to use in kids less than six months. I can't really find any evidence for why that is exactly. I think there's some concern it might affect developing kidneys, but I've actually read small studies that look at kids and how they process uh, NSAIDs that there wasn't really any harm seen with children like three to six months. Now, in a really young kid, maybe not. Um, if you want to get very technical, yes, maybe avoid them, NSAIDs, until you get to that point. Acetaminophen you can give to any age child, so that would be your go-to in that case. For me, um, with a febrile kid, I think it's nice to be able to alternate them. And this is where recommendations get a little tricky. Some people will say don't alternate them because if you tell a pa parent they can, they might accidentally double up on one of them and not realize they did it because they weren't paying attention. So alternating is fine, and you can actually give them at the same time if you want to. Just make sure that 
the parent is documenting. Like if I do it, I keep a log on like a, a draft email or like a note, a post-it note or something like that of when I gave the dose and every time I did it because I all forget for sure. So if a parent's going to alternate, make sure that they just know to write it down and to take it seriously because if you double up on the Tylenol a couple times, that could be hard on the liver. If you double up on the acetaminophen or the ibuprofen a couple times, that can be hard on the kidneys and the GI tract. So just making sure that they're paying attention to that, but alternating certainly appropriate and unacceptable uh, if the patient, parent is comfortable doing it. Um, sucrose, uh, for little babies, they use sucrose, um, oral, just oral sugar for minor procedures. So I think of like at our hospital, it's on the circumcision order set, so that's the common thing that it's used for, but certainly like a small laceration repair in a neonate. Uh, my sucrose can actually has clinical evidence giving little baby sugar water relieves their pain, so it's kind of cute. You usually give them Tylenol too, but so. Um, opioids. Codeine, tramadol, oxycodone, methadone, all acceptable use for different indications. Um, methadone would really be for opioid dependent or addicted mothers. It's probably the only time you'd ever see it. But um, PO, consider taste. I don't know. I'd probably never really see a use for codeine or tramadol in kids, but you never know. Always stick to kind of the basic opioids if you're going to go with any of them at all. Um, bowel medications, naloxone also apply. Overconstipation can happen in kids, just like with adults, so be careful with that. Spend a couple slides here quick on cystic fibrosis. I'm not going to ask a ton of questions on this, just because super specialized. Um, but if you work in pediatrics, especially if you like do any rotations at the U, they're a pretty big CF center, so you'll probably run into it. And I don't know if you guys have connections there or not. But anyway, Minnesota is pretty well known for its CF care, believe it or not. Um, and the U has uh, been a pioneer in different stages of CF treatment throughout the years. So anyway, it's kind of cool to talk about. It's a different disease. Um, it's worth just spending a couple minutes on. So cystic fibrosis, mutations in cystic fibrosis transmit, membrane regular, regulator protein. Basically, you get these um, thick secretions in different organs that come out and clog up stuff and cause damage or cause um, media for infectious uh, uh, organisms to take hold in. So, for example, thick secretions in the lungs kind of sit in the bottom. People can't breathe very well, and also those thick secretions tend to be a nice pool for all kinds of really bizarre bugs. CF kids grow really odd bacteria, so broad-spectrum antibiotics are well into play here. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff about the genetics with CF that I'm not going to talk about just because it's not really relevant to this course, but in case you're curious, it's there. Life expectancy is pretty short for somebody with CF, but that's been going up steadily, and it depends on the treatment center, too. They've actually, one of, there's a big thing that came out a while ago that um, certain treatment centers were getting way higher life expectancy for their CF patients than other treatment centers. So people were moving across the country to Minnesota or other places that have good treatment centers to, um, to get that extra life expectancy, which is understandable. Um, but I think there's been a lot more standardization, but still, it can depend on what treatment center you go to. Uh, just looking at the different organs that are affected and the different things we're going to talk about with respect to uh, cystic fibrosis treatment. So most of it's going to fo function, uh, focus on the pulmonary area, and that's going to be the thing that eventually somebody will either need a lung transplant or they might die from that particular complication. The rest of it, certainly the, the issues with the GI tract and the pancreas can cause problems. We can mitigate that more. Um, infertility, uh, certainly not ideal, right? But it's not going to be uh, ultimately fatal to somebody. So it's really the pulmonary complications that we're most concerned about. Again, the genetics is kind of interesting. Just put that up there. Um, okay, so treatment. Uh, let's talk about some of the, the less, well, I don't know, the less serious stuff first. Pancreas involvement, so pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy is indicated for these kids. I haven't talked about this at all, but um, pancreatic enzyme in, uh, replacement is common in certain diseases. Sometimes we see it in, um, like, ooh, you might see it, like, given in uh, gastric bypass patients or things like that. And sometimes there is different indications for it. But anyway, the point is, is that um, there's products on the market that have uh, combination of lipase, protease, and amylase. So they're designed to break down your lipids, your proteins, and your sugars. And so uh, people whose pancreases don't function well don't produce those things naturally, and that's why we supplement it in cystic fibrosis patients. Um, vitamin supplementation, fat and water soluble, soluble vitamins are both important, so making sure you're getting that because they won't absorb quite as well without um, the pancreas involvement. 
and diabetes, very uh, high prevalence, up to 50% of CF patients um, will develop kind of a type 1 diabetic picture. Uh, so management with insulin, that usually takes time. It's a little bit slower to, to start up than somebody with an autoimmune disease that's causing the, the killing of the beta cells, but over time they will lose their pancreatic function with CF. Other GI involvement, esophagus, uh, esophageal involvement can cause reflux, uh, PPIs and H2 blockers are indicated. Uh, cirrhosis of the liver over time. Uh, there's something called ursodial or actigal, which I'm not concerned you remember that for the exam, but it can dissolve bile stones and help with calcium, uh, cholesterol reabsorption and secretion, help process the liver, process things through the liver a little bit better for CF patients. But ultimately, that's something that, that might be tricky to avoid in the long term. But again, your liver, um, kind of like the pancreas, can take a long time for CF to really damage the liver to an appreciable extent, and most people would have lung issues far be far before they would get liver issues for, for the general um, CF population. Um, pulmonary involvement, obstruction, inflammation, and infection. Um, so you get the viscous mucus that provides a nutrient-rich medium for microorganisms. Your treatment goal is to improve secretion clearance to get that junk out of the lungs and then to prevent and treat an infection. So there's a couple ways you can do this. You can do this by percussion. Which is, I'm going to show you a picture of a vest, but they actually wear vests that pound on the chest, both front and back, and that loosens up the secretions. And at the same time, they can uh, do some suction and nebulization treatments. So they open up the lungs with a neb, like a bronchodilator, like albuterol, ipratropium, or longer acting agents as well. They do percussion, and that can help get the secretions out that way. Um, a lot of times, patients might just kind of cough them up naturally, but they might need to be suctioned in, in more advanced illness. Um, Dornase Alpha is a drug. Um, called pulmazyme, which is an inhaled biologic. It cleaves highly po poly polymerized uh, DNA found in CF mucus, and it reduces the viscosity. So it helps those really thick secretions thin out, and you can get rid of them easier. Again, it's another nebulized product. Um, hypertonic saline um, also helps uh, reduce viscosity of the mucus. So you can have multiple NEV regimens with these kids. And um, I haven't even talked about the infectious disease ones yet. So the other one that can be used sometimes is mucomist. I didn't bold it because um, N-acetylcysteine smells like sulfur, and most people don't want to inhale something that smells like that. So it's not routinely used because of that. However, it does work for that. This is what the vests look like. Kind of like this big life jacket thing with pneumatic tubing attached to it that pounds in a percussive motion. Uh, other therapies, glucocorticoids inhaled or oral could be used for an acute exacerbation, not recommended for chronic use for reasons why we've already talked about um, during glucocorticoid lecture. <laughs> Antimicrobials, so again, high, uh, highly unusual bacteria, um, and antibiotic resistance is really common in CF populations. Organisms are really difficult to treat in, in general. If somebody gets a systemic infection from their lungs of some of these odd bugs, it can be really difficult because we don't have we don't have antibiotics that are equipped to deal with some of these really resistant, odd pathogens that you just don't see in the general population ever. Um, severe infections, you need to cover MRSA, another broad spectrum approach like we would any severe thing. So basically you're looking at a pseudomonas type coverage picture. So carbapenem plus vancomycin or um, sometimes people will double cover the gram negative. So carbapenem plus maybe a fluoroquinolone or, um, you know, whatever combination you want to pick there, but it's, uh, it's a strategy that's used more aggressively in CF patients. Um, suppressive therapy can be used. A couple different ways uh, we do this. One is tobermycin nebs, so again, another nebulized product, um, which can be done uh, multiple times a day or daily, and that can prevent some of those really nasty bugs from growing. Um, daily azithromycin doesn't really do a whole lot to kill the bacteria. Um, however, it can have uh, what's called a biofilm penetration and make it so bacteria are less likely to develop kind of thick layers. And um, while it doesn't necessarily suppress the growth overall, it can have some, some positive effects. Sometimes that's used as a daily medication orally um, in, a, in conjunction with like a tobermycin nev and some other things. All right, that's really all I want to talk about uh, CF. I would just you know, know a little bit about the nebulized treatments um, that, that they can be used to thin secretion. That's pretty much it. Um, antimicrobial would always be broad spectrum if you're going to treat uh, a CF patient. 
All right, sickle cell disease, not necessarily a pediatric disease, but um, something that would certainly affect kids, uh, and you might see if you work in, um, in pediatric medicine. And we haven't really talked about it anywhere else, so let's throw it in here. Um, hemoglobin molecule abnormal, abnormality due to amino acid substitution. So you get sickle cell-shaped red blood cells that get stuck places and cause damage, usually to microvasculature. Um, patients with African heritage, I see this when it, well, I don't work in the ED as much as I used to, but I used to see this fairly frequently in our local population here in Minneapolis. You, you will see this if you practice locally here, especially if you do urgent care, ER, or even family practice. You'll see plenty of people who have sickle cell history or sickle cell complications. Um, the most common complications, again, are usually microvasculature, vaso occlusion, so you get some sort of blockage to different things, and usually it manifests in pain especially in the, the hands and the feet is what people present to most commonly. And it's really severe. There's not a lot you can do for sickle cell pain other than some things like transfusion. So you can transfuse out the sickle cells. Or a lot of these people have, I see really high doses of opioids used because they're used to it. Nothing else really touches their pain. So you might see do doses of Dilaudid or fentanyl that make you a little squeamish. And that's just kind of run of the mill for sickle cell patients. Uh, male patients, priapism, so um, they can get, uh, the, the cells can build up in the penis too, and you can end up with a sustained erection that you can't get rid of any other way other than sometimes transfusion or as aspiration of the blood itself. So um, those are the things that I've seen more commonly. You can get end organ damage as well, um, but that would be more of a long-term un, uh, uncontrolled um, disease state. Uh, I don't really want to talk too much about the rest of this. You can have risks of... Um, pulmonary issues that can lead to uh, pneumonia-like presentations. Um, you can have cerebral vascular in accidents, so stroke risk is much more increased, 11% incidence by age 20, so much higher than the general population, of course. Uh, mostly with this stuff, you, you need to do an exchange transfusion. You have to get rid of the sickle cells. Our standard clot-busting drugs might have some effect if, if, it, if it is sort of a clot-like picture, but at the end of the day, it's probably just the sickle cells, and that won't necessarily respond to alteplase, so you have to exchange transfusion. Get rid of as much of their blood as you can and replace it with something that doesn't have sickle cells in it. Uh, some more stuff here. Again, I don't really care. You know much of this, um, other than that it occurs in their complications associated with sickle cell disease. Uh, final re system, uh, psych... Neurotopics, basically the exact same thing as adult. I'm not going to test you on anything specifically with this. We already talked about ADHD, which is probably the most common thing, and tested on that, so I won't rehash that today. But uh, most of the drugs we use in adults, uh, almost across the board, are used in pediatrics to various degrees. So not really any different there. Just, again, difference in doses. All right. That's it. So I'll have